the attempt today is to go further um, into how we interpret things via my experience of Dante and under the influence of Anthony Lowenstein, a very perceptive Australian Jewish writer and thinker. I know that all of this makes me seem, might make me seem, it would make me seem if I was encountering my stuff to seem incredibly intellectual and it, I, it's really not. It just all comes out in a rush. So anyway, do I care who live next, lives next door to me? I live in a very safe, comfortable part of Northern New Jersey. It was not my choice. I didn't buy the house. My father did. It's a terrible house. I'm essentially nomadic. It is the reality of my work and relationship to money. I get by no more with windfalls every now and then. Nomadic, unambitious, no ancestral home, just all of it, the whole world. No identity, but all of you. No ancestry at all, really. Is it an English trait, tray? a reservedness, or is it class? I met one grandmother once, have had scant encounters with uncles, cousins, and they were huffy. I put it down to middle-class Englishness, but I could be wrong. Uh, I am close to my siblings, but it isn't ritualized. I never dreaded Thanksgiving with right-wing uncles. There were no Thanksgivings. Watching TV, I feel like I'm harshly in the minority. This may explain... And I would move at the drop of a hat. Should the Lenape return and demand their land, I would say, OK. I have lived all over in all kinds of places and have felt safe in all of them. Places that friends, however, ha would not visit. Where other friends would insist that had they lived there, they'd own a gun. They probably owned one anyway in Buckhead. They like the illusion of danger, perhaps. I do not have a family, nuclear, wife, children. I have other loves I worry about, but no one I feel I need to protect, except for all the dogs in the world. If I did, I am educated enough to know that they are as much in danger from the guy next door as from some myth in Patterson or Palestine. This is full disclosure, a description so anyone reading or listening knows that I am different from them or not. In a sense, I'm not respectable. In other words, I should not be respected or there is no reason to respect me relative to yourself. I do not carry the burdens that other people do, but I carry other burdens. That I am not sectarian may be attached to these realities of my life. And I also, I have to confess, have a very strong sense of self. It may be Hellenic in character, if that helps at all. Simple example, Themistocles to young Greek Aristo, let's go fight the Persians at Marathon. Answer, why? To defend Athens and Greek civilization. Answer, what's that? For the gods, why? They are immortal. To know your own courage, to defy death. Ah, now you're talking. I serve in a muddled way the entire human race. That is my community. I have no favorites. I sense that if my neighbor were African, Sudanese, Muslim, they'd be no more alien to me than the white couple there right now, which is to say they might have more in common with each other than I with them. And that is not the point of neighbors for me, commonness. So after yesterday's expedition into the unknown terrain of religious identity, I ask why we feel the need of it. That's it. It is clear we do, and that threatening its fundamentals causes us to run around like chimpanzees smelling a lion in the vicinity. If we were born into it, which must be the usual way to the Lord, I can attest that since I was not born into it, it has no purchase on me. Had I been reborn, I could tell a useful tale indeed, perhaps like Soul on Fire by Eldridge Cleaver, sequel to Soul on Ice, a very moving story, and I am a fan of that man. He acknowledges his great need at the moment he had a vision in France, on the run and disillusioned, contemplating suicide, a vision of Jesus. He had a need and a reality he had been reared around manifest. In my hour of darkness, Mother Mary comes to me like Dante. This is a kind of religion, found, not automatic. By the way, we have all seen Jesus, haven't we? I pity those who haven't. He's an amazing manifestation of what's within, but I guess he is forbidden within 
We are all born sinners and that did not work. But as manifestations go, he's up there with Orpheus and Elvis and Siddhartha. Do I believe in him? Funny word, believe, so needy. So Dante and Eldridge, in great distress, see visions. Dante, from within the religion, Eldridge from without. Dante sees Beatrice, Beatrice, so obviously his anima, but no one will soil his rep with something so Jungian. I wonder about this banished man, this nomad by banishment, this man longing for home. How do we know? We long for home, therefore. We write that he longed for home. I never asked him, neither did his biographers. I did wonder, encountering an interpretation recently, that today he'd be insane. He might have written a canto and had a good giggle. It is the sculptor that carved him so sad. And from here, we do all the assuming. We decided he craved something sustaining. I understand this. Perhaps my religion is only that I have other visions from other traditions touching other spiritual points within, and I am into all of that. Still, it comes back to need of solace, meaning, I don't know, I do not have it. Perhaps I have not had my Eldridge moment, but very few believers have. Their God is there before the moment. The suicidal moment is in fact forbidden. Lucky me, but who wants this life, this way of choosing and not being chosen? To the point, these beliefs, these responses to need make us killers. Science has told us about selfish genes and murderous apes. They are as whims by comparison with the murderous motivating of religion. It is the same impulse, exactly as the jealous lover or the starving thief. It is self-defense. I cannot survive. Myself cannot survive the existence of the other. Did any 11th century knight tell the Pope Urban II, quote, ain't no brown man oppressed me, enslaved me, raped my women, you my oppressor, you my enemy, end quote? Of course not. Who knighted him, gave him his monotonous identity? At least there is no story. Ridley Scott has made no film of that guy. There is a wonderful article I cannot find about, find about the banality of conquerors, not of evil, but close. Four to five years ago, London Review of Books, probably, I'll have a hunt to let you know. It dug into the dullness of German life in the 30s. Yes, the depression, but something else. That the conquerors of history often wipe out people much more interesting than they almost a kind of jealousy. Often the excuse is that the natives are not aspirational. They don't exploit the land they live on. They make no empires. It is we, the unsatisfied, who should rule. Think about it. What vivid life did Columbus have to offer the Caribbeans? It's worth pondering. Why are so many Americans addicted to drugs, so interested in the, un so uninterested in the unexamined, so interested, so interested in the unexamined life, filled with toys. And when you achieve dominance, your aspiration, you insurrect against each other. Of course, the Republicans don't want to support Ukraine. They hate enough at home. And the Russians are, you know, white and Christian. There are ways through. The impulse towards self-fulfillment is huge and unabating. It is hard, a hard and uncharted road. We let the path grow over with weeds or built walls. Subsuming the desire into the smothering of a belief in daddy takes you to limbo and leaves you there. Themistocles Greeks demand a way to, to self-knowledge. The defender of God and country agrees to be cannon fodder. The children in Gaza have not lived long enough to make this agreement. Their collective grave is a monument to the hubris of the obedient, the needy.